so just first of all, I'm curious about your experience with sport growing up in Queensland. What sports did you play? Like, what did you watch and who inspired you? Yes. So I played, I did, I think gymnastics was probably first, artistic gymnastics and netball on a Saturday. And then um, I lived next door to a tennis centre, so I played a fair bit of tennis. And then I got too tall for artistic gymnastics, so I switched across to rhythmic gymnastics. And that was sort of high school. I did volleyball in high school. And then out of school, I kind of played mixed touch at uni, um, took up running in my 20s. Um, so a bit of a mix, all very average. <laughs> Um, and just also, do you have one sporting moment from your childhood that kind of just sticks out? Look, I think there's there's lots. I'm trying to think of a formative one. Vicky Wilson came to our school um, when I think she might have just retired as, as captain of the Australian football team. And that was oh, wow. very <laughs> exciting. Um, and also I sort of remember um, my dad was a triathlete growing up, so we used to always go to watch him on a Sunday morning, I had to wake up to 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Um, he got me to do a kid's triathlon at some point, maybe when I was uh-huh. 10, 11, uh-huh. something like that. So um, him kind of cheering me on as, as I gave that a go is also quite a formative memory. That's cool. Um, and just changing topics a bit, we've seen over the years that unfortunately women politicians are sometimes treated differently, like more harshly than men. <laughs> what made you want to be in politics? <sighs> I don't know if sometimes as so much as constantly. <laughs> Um, what made me want to be in politics? I was always interested. I was always interested in politics. Um, I did debating at school. I did public speaking at school. Um, I was always interested in politics and the law, and I think that's because law is all about you know, the application of the law and you see where it falls down, um, particularly for your clients, and then politics is about changing the law and making new law. So I think there's sort of a natural intersection there. Yeah. But for me, when I decided to actually try and stop being a lawyer and become an MP, it was because a couple of things happened to me in a couple of months that changed the course of my life. I got pregnant with my first baby and I um, became symptomatic with what became a moderately aggressive chronic disease. So overnight I went from someone who'd started a park run, always been very healthy, to um, someone who was just being constantly hospitalised, very sick. And then she was born, she was born a girl, and she was born right around the time that President Donald Trump was sworn in. And there were these women's marches on the TV about how women had sort of just taken for granted that things would get better and that they were not going to take it for granted anymore and they were were marching to sort of demonstrate that to themselves and and to one another. And I sort of felt like that was that moment for me too. It was sort of I'd taken things for granted, I'd taken my health for granted, I'd taken that um, Celeste would be born into a world where things would get better for her and all of that seemed at risk with President Donald Trump being sworn in, which seems funny now given what panned out but. Um, I decided that I would sort of take the next opportunity and um, the next opportunity for me was my federal MP, Wayne Swan, decided to retire and I sought his support to run in his seat in junior. That's really cool. Well, that's, I guess that's a bit how I started her way. I was like annoyed with like kind of how everything was going and how women were treated. That's right. I think that drives <laughs> a lot of us. I think yeah. like a lot of my colleagues have a similar story where there was one um, catalyzing moment for them and that's what made them actually decide to run for them. Yeah. Um, And you are obviously the Minister for Sport. So over the next decade, we have a lot of um, important women's events coming up, like the Women's Football World Cup this year. And then we've got the Commonwealth um, Commonwealth Games 2026, the Women's Rugby World Cup 2029, and the Brisbane Olympics 2032. What do you think is possible with these events? Um, It's the the green and gold runway. Like I can't believe my luck that I get to be the sports minister. Um, through all this because it ends with like you say an Olympic and Paralympic Games in my hometown and getting to be one of the stewards of what we do to prepare our kids our people and our country and what we want it to look like in the eyes of the world in 2032 is a really powerful opportunity and um, Celeste my my baby girl is now six and I have twin boys who are two and I think about from playground to podium you know, what do we need to give yeah. our kids who are in the playground now to give them the opportunity to hit the podium if they want to by Brisbane yeah. 2032. So that's where my thought is at the moment, what pathways programs will help kids do that. And actually just with the Women's World Football World Cup, last July you and I were both at the One Year to Go event here in Sydney. The FIFA Secretary General Fatma Samara said that day. And today is an opportunity also for me to make a plea 
to the government of Australia in particular, because right after the last whistle, you will see a huge increase in the number of young girls who would like to, uh, to register to play football. And uh, it's time that we start from now on making sure that they have the um, uh, facilities available to allow them also to become one day football stars. How is the government um, helping to get Australia ready now for all of the girls and women who will want to play football after it's over? Yes, and I really think most Australians have no idea what's about to hit them in terms of how big an event this is. It's the third biggest event in the world. Um, so I think Australians are about to have an almighty great shock. <laughs> Um, we've been working with Football Australia and um, the FIFA Women's World Cup organising group about what kind of legacy will be left for people in Australia after the World Cup moves on. And we've got some good programs that will help kids who might not otherwise have been able to afford to get into soccer or to football um, that will be available for them, um, particularly kids from um, multiple cold backgrounds, culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, and um, kids who are refugees and new migrants to the country. Um, so I'm excited about those programs rolling out, which we're looking at in conjunction with Football Australia. But what I'm hoping is that, like you, I'm sure, that it will give women's sport in this country some serious momentum um, and that everybody, particularly corporate sponsorship or that kind of thing, will come to the party and help fund women athletes in months and years to come. Yeah. Um, and if we just think ahead to the Olympics in Brisbane 2032, girls my age now will be in our early 20s, which is crazy. Yeah. And there are so many sports um, where they could represent Australia in, yeah. not just the obvious ones like the swimming and the athletics, but everything from skateboarding, volleyball, handball, possibly even breakdancing and lacrosse as well, which is really cool. I like the rock climbing. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Probably too. <laughs> How do you think that the government can kind of help those lesser-known sports to um, just – be us be sports for like girls yeah. like my age and boys my age now to be I, able to compete in that's a great question because i think something that i've noticed becoming the sports minister is that some sports are really sophisticated in how they interact with government how they seek sponsorship yeah. or funding um and other sports just don't have that capacity they're run by a mum at her kitchen table so i guess my job i feel as a, as a steward of australian sport and women's sport in particular which i think you and i share as a passion is um, helping all of the sports with that capacity. So I'm working with the um, Australian Sports Commission who runs the Australian Institute of Sport to make sure that we've got programs in place that no matter which sport you are, you can access that um, support, the information, the programs to make sure that your sport is prepared. And also just about the Brisbane Olympics, Hawaii has a lot of netball fans, so I just have to ask, do you think Nettie could be a good chance of the Brisbane Olympics? <laughs> um, well, um, I think we'd all love to see netball make the Brisbane Olympic and Paralympic Games. The the It's ultimately a decision for, you know, lots of people. Yeah. Um, but you have to be popular, obviously. Um, you have to be um, successful with young people, tick, and you have to be good on gender equality. So actually mm -hmm. the best thing that netty enthusiasts can do to try and get netball up for the Brisbane 2032 Games is encourage their male friends to take up the sport. That's very really different to all the other ones, I guess. It's yeah, like the yeah, other like problem. problem. <laughs> um, and just when we talk about equality, I think some people might get a bit nervous because they think it means that they're going to lose something that so that others can like benefit off of it. Mm. Why should everyone want to embrace equality? Mm. Well, I've never seen it as um, losing something. Um, I think it's about a rising tide lifts all boats and we all do better when everyone has the opportunity. And something that I think I've noticed about women's sport in this country is that you know it's, it's been growing in enthusiasm, it's been growing in popularity, it's been growing in success, but the structures of sport in place are essentially were made around men's sport. So we have these kind of ad hoc programs, um, ad hoc money that goes towards initiatives in women's sport, but women themselves are expected to retrofit into the system. So what I would like to see is us to reform the sporting system so that men and women's sports sit equal and that the support that athletes need to succeed, no matter what sex they are, are there, rather than it being an ad hoc thing that comes and goes with different governments' yep. levels of enthusiasm yeah. for it. <laughs> what do you think is the biggest challenge that women just face in politics kind of nowadays? Um... 
I think it's hard to get there in the first place. There's lots of, I mean, obviously the Labor Party put in place rules more than 20 years ago now to ensure that women got seats at the table and that's now come into fruition because people like me are the youngest female, you know, the youngest minister and I'm, and I'm a woman and um, I had twins whilst in parliament and these are things that I can do because I have supportive colleagues who want to see young women like me succeed. Yeah. Um, I think something that is turning people away is social media and how derogatory and cruel and abusive people can be online. They say things they wouldn't put their name to in real life. Yeah. So I think that we're sp- still probably paying a bit of catch up in how we support everybody online in a way that still gives people their democratic voice but doesn't turn off so many um, women of calibre and quality that we don't get the kind of representation that we want in the federal parliament. Yeah, and I know it's kind of similar to that question, but what would you say to young women and girls that want to be in politics um, but are perhaps worried about maybe not being treated equally? Um, Well, I mean, I sort of would point to look at the opportunities that I've had you know, I was the youngest woman in the house when I got elected. I'm the youngest minister now. Um, I've had twins in the parliament. Um, I would not have been able to do that if I had felt like it wasn't a place where I could succeed. I have a great boss. The PM is super supportive. Um, I have a lot of colleagues who have done this themselves. You know, people like Tanya Plibersek had her babies in parliament last government <laughs> and and she's around people like Katie Gallagher, Penny Wong, all the same. They're around to make sure that people like me get thought of and um, given the supports that they need. So I would say, um, yeah, it can be pretty rugged, but so can a lot of industries. And if we don't have people showing up and taking their seats at the table, we will not get the policy change that women want to see in this country. Thanks for listening. To support Hoa, visit the link in the description section.